Hello and Merry Christmas! My name is Patricia Meredith and I am the author of the Spokane Clock Tower Mysteries, which are now available in print, ebook, and audiobook everywhere books are sold. That's right, the first three are now out. I have promised to continue the series. I hope to do a total of 12 books in the series, um, but the first three are available and that does complete the first arc. So if you're one of those people who doesn't like to start a series until it's finished, now's the time to start reading this series. You can read the first three and then you can take a break for a while and wait until the next three come out. Uh, I am currently working on book four, so thank you to everybody who has been reading my books and has been asking me when is the next book coming out. Um, the third book only just released, that's right, Crazy Maids in a Row, just came out in October. And it's already Christmas after October, I can't believe it. Um, but here we are. Last year, I started a series where I decided to bake from 19th century cookbooks because if you haven't noticed from my books, I love doing research into the 19th century. Um, my books are set in 1901, and so I try to find cookbooks that my characters might have used at that time. Now, I've ended up stretching a little bit on either side of it because what I found is that recipes are around for a long period of time, right? And they come from all different places. So even a cookbook that was published in 1905, which is one of the ones I'll be cooking from this year, the recipes probably have been around since 1901. In fact, they're probably a family recipe that has been tried for the last four years, and then they submitted it in order to get it published in that year's edition. So I have decided to say that I am cooking from circa 1900. Um, I have a cookbook from uh, late 1800s all the way to 1905, uh, and including a book that is from 1901 this year. So I'm very excited to share those with you guys. Um, over the next three weeks, I'll be sharing those. Uh, I've chosen one recipe out of each book. Um, and I'm very excited to cook those and see how they work. So um, I hope that you will join me in, uh, in this baking trilogy. So let's get baking. So this first recipe for apple pie actually comes from a mix of two different recipe books and then my own personal way that I like to make apple pie. So one of the first ones that I found was this one. Uh, it's the Compendium of Cookery and Reliable Recipes, and it was published in 1890. Um, and so I, in here, I found the apple pie recipe, and it's very funny because it's very simple. Um, I like to compare 19th century cookbook recipes to doing a technical for the Great British Baking Show because, as you'll see, there's a few items missing from the method. <laughs> um, so it says to first stew green or ripe apples when you have pared and cored them. Mash to a smooth compote, sweeten to taste, and while hot, stir in a teaspoon of butter for each pie. Season with nutmeg. When cool, fill your crust and either crossbar the top with strips of paste or bake without cover. Eat cold with powdered sugar strewed over it. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not a huge fan of cold apple pie. I suppose some people might enjoy it that way. I actually am one of those silly people who love to put cheddar cheese on top of my apple pie if it's a double crust. Now, if you do a streusel topping, then it just has to be eaten straight up, in my opinion. So the other recipe book that I found with an apple pie recipe, because let's be honest, every cookbook probably has a recipe for apple pie. Uh, the other one was a book for a cook which is actually published by Pillsbury in 1905. So you'll find that in these recipes, they often don't say to add flour. They say just to add Pillsbury's best and hope that you realize that that is flour. So there's actually a nice ad for it right there on the back. <laughs> so let me share with you the apple pie recipe that I found in here. Now here again, you'll see that there's something missing. Uh, we first have the materials, uh, apples, sugar, water, pie paste, cinnamon, and butter. That's right, no measurements. <laughs> then it says the way of preparing. Line a deep pie tin with rich paste, select large tart apples, pare and quarter, and cut each quarter into four pieces. Put an even layer of these pieces in the prepared tin, sprinkle with sugar, dot with butter, dust with cinnamon, and bake in a moderate oven for 45 minutes. Three tablespoons of prepared tea are sometimes used instead of the water for moistening. Quantity. This will serve four or six. 
Wow, a pie that only feeds four or six people. That's impressive. My pies tend to feed at least eight, if not more. Um, so as you'll notice in this one, although the measurements are missing, this one did include to cook in a moder moderate oven uh, for 45 minutes. The other one didn't include what heat to bake it at or how long to bake it at. Uh, you will definitely find that in most cookbooks like this uh, from the 19th century, they never give a degree. And that's because on the oven, they didn't have a way of recording how hot it was. Now, later ovens, like by the time of about 1901, the ranges would start including how hot it was inside the oven. But a good cook, someone who was familiar with baking, could really just reach their hand in there and say, mm, yeah, this is about a moderate oven. So a moderate oven is usually 350, 375. So if you know anything about baking, you would know that that's what you cook cookies, cake, pie at. Um, and then uh, a higher oven, uh, so a high oven would be uh, 425, 450, 500, which is what you would cook bread at. If you're cooking meat, it's usually going to be low and slow, so it's going to be more like 250, so it would be called a low oven. Now, the way I've been taught to make pie is that you start it really hot. So if I was baking in the 1900s, I would probably stoke that fire, get it right really, really, really hot, get that pan in there, get that crust really started, nice and crispy, and then I would just let the fire come down a little bit until it was about a moderate oven. Because as you'll see in my recipe, that's how I recommend cooking a pie, is I start at 425, so I preheat my oven to 425, and then after 15 minutes of baking, I turn it down to 375, um, and then let it cook for another half an hour. And that tends to be the perfect length of doing a pie crust. Now that's doing a pie crust not blind baked beforehand before you put all the filling in. That is rolling up the pie crust, putting the filling in just like they say, covering it up and slipping it in the oven um, and then just baking it all together. So please come bake a pie with me. Let me walk you through the steps that I do normally and let's make this pie together. So when I bake an apple pie, the first thing that I do is I bake a crust. Um, and in these recipe books, most of them called for making pie paste, which is different than a pie crust. But nowadays we usually, when we think pie, we don't think pie paste. So I went ahead and made it my normal way with pie crust. Now a pie crust is very simple to do. So you start by gathering your ingredients. You're going to need three cups of flour. You're going to need one cup of butter or margarine. You're going to need one to two teaspoons of salt, and then you're going to need cold water. And it's an uncertain amount. I generally fill my little two cup holder of water, and I put some ice in there to make sure it's really nice and cold because you want cold water. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to measure out that flour, and then you're going to add your salt. Mix it lightly together, and then add about half of your butter. It doesn't have to be exact. It's just only about half of it. Now, my butter, you'll notice, I took frozen butter and I shaved it down into little bits to put it in there. That's because you want your butter really nice and cold for a good pastry crust. So back in the 19th century, they would have had a pastry cutter, so I went ahead and used mine to cut up my butter into my flour. But you can also use your fingers, and sometimes that's actually even better um, if you don't mind getting dirty. I mean, eventually you're going to. You're going to need to get your hands in there. So some people prefer to start with a pastry cutter and then move to using your fingers. Sometimes I like to just get there in my fingers so that way I can feel the consistency of the butter mixed with the flour and salt. Um, so you're going to mix that in until it's about pea-sized little balls in your flour. Then you're going to add the rest of the butter, do it again, keep going until it's all mixed, all right? It's going to be really dry and crumbly. Then you start adding your water. Now you're going to add cold water a little bit at a time. That's because you don't know how much you need. Every time you make a, a pie crust, it's going to be different uh, because it depends on what the weather is like that day. It depends on how dry it is, how wet it is, right? Flour is a finicky beast. And so every time you bake with it, it's going to be different. So I would recommend getting your hands in there, getting the water in there. Sometimes the ice falls out of the thing. You just pick up the ice and put it back in the water. It doesn't matter because it's all going to mix together anyway, right? But you don't want chunks of ice in your, in your pastry crust. So yes, pull the ice out. But 
Um, so you just keep going, keep going until it's the right consistency. Unfortunately, there's no measurements here. Baking a pie crust is very much by hand and by eye and by touch, right? And so you just got to feel it until it's about the right consistency. Um, look at the pictures and you'll see that um, it it's once it comes together, right? You want it to come together, but you don't want it to still be wet and sticky, but you also don't want it to be too dry with flour, right? So you want it just enough that it can come together and you can make it into two balls. So you're gonna separate it into two balls, pack it together, and if it packs together nicely into two balls, you're at the right place. So then you're gonna put that pie crust into the fridge. Now you can make your filling. So according to the measurements and the ideas in the 19th century cookbooks, I decided to add cinnamon and nutmeg to my, uh, to my apple pie mix. Uh, as you can see, I started with my apples. They were already cored and I didn't peel them actually because I like the skin on my apple. Uh, so it's up to you if you want to, you know, slice, dice, core, peel. So actually these are apples from our farm from before we moved. Um, so it was very tender to me making this pie this year um, because they are the last ones that I still had frozen. Um, I would cut up a bunch of apples and then I would freeze them in with the intention of making apple pie in the future. Now I like chunks of apple. You'll see that in one of the recipes it suggested making basically an apple sauce to go into your apple pie. I think most people when they picture apple pie picture the slices. So grab your apples, your cinnamon, your nutmeg, and your sugar. You need about a third of a cup, maybe a quarter of a cup. It depends on how sweet you like your apple pie. So again, with baking, it's kind of all to taste. So, and as you saw in the recipe book, it didn't even include how much. So you're just going to do, yep, that's about right for an apple pie. So mix all that together. Uh, you can use a wooden spoon or your hands. Again, you're going to get a little goopy, but this time you can actually taste it and it tastes really good. So, all right. So now you've got your pie crust, which is in the fridge, and you've got your filling. Now the pie crust needs to be left in the fridge for at least half an hour. So if it didn't take you half an hour to make the filling, leave it in there for at least half an hour because it needs to get nice and cold, nice and chilled. And again, that's in the fridge, not in the freezer. I don't recommend freezing it um, if you're going to immediately make the pie. Now, however, you can pre-make the pie crust and stick it in the freezer and pull it out when you need to make a pie. I would recommend letting it sit so it can get a little bit more malleable. Uh, I would not pull it immediately out of the freezer. In fact, you can't pull it out of the freezer and immediately turn it into a pie. So the next step is I sprinkle my workspace with some flour and I grab a rolling pin and I grab my pan that I'll be putting in the oven. At this point, I also preheat my oven to 425. So like I said before, this is how I get a nice, good, crispy crust on my crust without doing a blind bake is I start my oven at 425. This works even for a stone. I don't use a heated stone when I bake my pies. I put it in cold, but it seems to work. I always end up with a non-soggy bottom for my pies. So there you go. So then I roll out the pie crust and it's okay if it flips over the edges. Go ahead and just press that into your pie pan. Dump your filling in, make sure it's even all the way across. Roll out your second ball of crust. Again, it's okay if it's a little uneven. The trick is it's going to be messy and then you take your scissors so that way you can get a nice clean cut around the edges of your pie crust. Then I fold over the edges and pinch them together in that way that my mom taught me. <laughs> uh, it's hard to explain but that's what you do. So you're pinching your pie crust together so that way it is connected so you don't have any bits bubbling up and out the edges. That's why you want to pinch it together. So then this is another trick that I learned from my mother is you add egg whites with water. So you're gonna take an egg white, just the egg white out of an egg, and then put in just a little bit of water. And then you're gonna brush that over the top of your crust. Now that is gonna make your crust so good. It is what makes it look professional when it comes out of the oven. I promise you, even for a sweet pie, this is worth doing, okay? Then for a sweet pie, you can sprinkle uh, over it uh, cinnamon sugar if you want, or you can just leave it with the egg crust. When I make chicken pot pie, this is also what I do to the crust, and I don't put any sugar on it. So then, for fun, because I actually made this pie for Thanksgiving, um, I went ahead and cut out a turkey out of the middle of it. 
and you definitely want to either put slits in the middle of your pie or cut out a fun decoration right there so that way uh, the the heat can escape from inside of the pie. So I usually end up with some extra pie crust and I do this on purpose because my kids love pie crust cookies. So pie crust cookies is something that I have always done when I bake pies, whether I'm making a savory pie or a sweet pie. What I do is I roll out the extra pie crust and then I cut it out just like you're making sugar cookies because they're going to hold their shape. All right. And then you put them on a pan and you brush butter over them and then cinnamon sugar. Now cinnamon sugar is something that I always have on hand because I'm a mom of two young kids and so it's worth always having and let's be honest sometimes I like putting it in my coffee or in my tea. It adds a little zing to it. I love it. So cinnamon sugar there's no like definite ratio for it. It's just you take sugar and you add cinnamon sugar until it looks about right and shake it up. I definitely would start with less cinnamon sugar than more um, and then mix it up and see, you know, is that dark enough? Do you think that's going to be a good blend? Um, and then you can always add more cinnamon sugar. It's much harder to take the cinnamon out if you accidentally put in too much. But this is something that you could even have your kids do, have them join in the fun. So like I said, butter, cinnamon sugar over the pie crust cookies, pop them in the oven with your pie. They will cook great alongside your pie during the 425 degree time. Uh, it usually just takes that 15 minutes and then when it, you have to turn down your oven to 375, that's a good time to pull out your pie crust cookies. So just keep an eye on them. Sometimes they take longer. It depends on how your oven is feeling that day. <laughs> All right, how did your pie turn out? Mine turned out great. All right, folks, thanks for joining me. Merry Christmas. I hope that you'll check out my books, Butcher, Baker, Candlestick Taker, Cupboards All Bared, and Crazy Maids in a Row. And those are the first three in the Spokane Clock Tower Mysteries. So if you like books that are historical mysteries set in 1901 Pacific Northwest, they feature a clockmaker, and of course, lots of baking, um, and they all come from recipes from old cookbooks because I love 19th century cookbooks. If you want to learn more about those, check out my website at patricia-meredith.com where I've gone in depth into some 19th century cookbooks and what they have to offer. Be sure to hit that subscribe button so that way you'll hear when I post my next video this year of 19th century baking. I plan to do two more videos. I'm hoping to do some cookies and a cake from some different cookbooks. So I hope you'll join me for that. Check out my videos from last year as well. I also posted three videos then. And I'm hoping to do a live bake here soon with a fellow booktuber. So follow me at patricia-meredith.com and on social media as at pmeredithauthor. So I hope to see more of you. I hope that you'll leave me a comment letting me know how your bake goes if you decide to try these recipes. And I hope you have a very Merry Christmas. Thanks. Thanks.